Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Reed, and I am the director of Bridgewater State University Senior College. Thank you for being here today for our final Ask the Scholar speaker event. We're thrilled to have um, Dr. Jenny Olin Shanahan with us today. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background of why we're here and what Senior College is all about. So for many of you that are here uh, live today, you know that Senior College is a lifelong learning program based out of Bridgewater State University. And our goal is to connect seniors in our community, older adults, with the great scholars that we have here at the university. Um, faculty members, we uh, use both full-time and part-time faculty members in our courses. We also use staff members quite a bit in the courses of senior college. And then we use other folks too out in the community. So we have some instructors that work at the local community colleges or who may be retired themselves from working as an educator or at another university. So our courses are short-term. They're generally, most of them are six weeks long and they are offered for uh, enrichment and learning for learning's sake. There's no tests, there's no papers. Um, sometimes there is out of class expectations, especially if you join a class that's like a book club or a course that's um, a, uh, focused on literature, then you would wanna do the readings in order to enhance your learning in that class. We have um, a membership model, so you can join for $85, and then you can take as many classes as you like. And we have this semester almost 50 courses, and you can take them either on Zoom, like we are here today, or you can take them in person. So we have classes in person in Plymouth, um, Bridgewater, Attleboro, and new this semester in Easton. So if in-person learning is something that you're interested in, we have lots of opportunities for that and we're growing all the time. We're talking to a couple of other communities right now because um, space is obviously at a premium here on our campus. And so we partner with local libraries and um, senior centers to have classes um, at their location too, which makes it very convenient uh, for our members as well. Um, so if you have any questions about senior college, you can certainly put them in the chat. Um, of course, the best place to find information about us is our website, um, which you can find online. Maybe Darlene could post the link to the website in the chat. That would be helpful. Um, and at, on our website, you can specifically see our quick glance uh, schedule, which is just a few pages long that lists all the classes. And you can also see our full course catalog and the course catalog gives you um, detailed uh, descriptions of the courses and also instructor bios. So that's worth reviewing to see what kind of classes are, are of interest to you. And then I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but you can take as many classes as you like for the single fee and you can all for the single $85 fee. And you can also get um, all the benefits of being a student at our campus. So you can get access to our library, our fitness center, um, our pool, uh, technical services, all kinds of great amenities that we have here. So if you're close to Bridgewater physically, um, or if you wanna visit the campus, you have the ability to do that too as a member. Okay, that's the plug, uh, but let's get to the real reason why we're here today for our conversation with Dr. Jenny Olin Shanahan. Um, uh, Dr. Shanahan is an assistant provost here at Bridgewater State University. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from St. Mary's College of California, a Master of Arts in English from San Francisco State University, and a PhD in English from Marquette University. So I think she takes the role of scholar quite seriously with all those degrees and a PhD behind her name. Um, Jenny, welcome for... Thank you so much for being here today and you have the floor and I'm here if you need anything. Thank you so much, Jen, and thanks to everyone for joining this morning. I, I see some, some friends, um, people I've known from class and from the community and I, I'm just thrilled to see your names and, and in some cases your, your beautiful faces. Um, this is going to be a learning opportunity for me as well as all of us, um, I truly hope, um, about something that is often difficult to discuss and something that um, can bring up strong emotions in, in people, sometimes unexpectedly. So uh, 
this medium of the Zoom screen in some ways makes things a little bit easier to discuss because you get a little bit of a distance, but in other ways it's difficult because we're not there with that intimacy of that connection human to human. Um, there's a quotation from Michelle Obama and uh, called it's hard to, or that says it's hard to hate up close. And um, I think when we are up close, it's, it's um, easier to kind of like try to understand where people are coming from and things like that. So I'm not going to um, have us open to discussion until the, the end, so to like the last 15, 20 minutes or so. But I will ask at times that if you'd like to, you can put some things in the chat. I'll, I'll pose some questions and then um, we'll look at some of those. So um, that's that's the context here. The original plan, as you may know, was for me to address white supremacist assumptions as a form of American addiction and to address it with principles from 12 step programs. And I've made a change um, I because I realized in preparing that talk and much of that is here, um, the, the prep that I was doing for that, that I was getting ahead of the issue a bit. Um, hitting rock bottom is a common um, trope for talking about addiction and 12 step. And that's a notion that um, the problem is so pervasive that um, the devastation so great that one is committed to taking this on for the rest of their life, but it requires very deep learning, reflection, and understanding before one can do that. Um, so I'd like to spend more of the time today in that space of our coming to realizations and then moving into what we're doing as a result of that. So I ended up titling this um, Anti-Racism 101 to indicate that this is a starting place. These are foundational ideas that then we build on as we go through the rest of our lives. Uh, I'll start with a little bit of my family's story in relation to racism, because racism affects our our own lives, as well as our um, institutions and structures. So I'll start with a personal um, story that from the perspective of a white person who grew up in a white family, what was um, some of the effect? I grew up in Los Angeles County in the 1970s and 80s, and it was um, as much of Los Angeles County is a diverse neighborhood, and, and, and I grew up going to diverse schools. And in our family, I am one of seven children, one of the worst things you could be was racist. My, our parents gave a very strong message about the dignity of each human person. And it very much was rooted in their social justice, Catholicism, that the um, divinity in each person um, was to be honored and cherished. Um, and that any kind of prejudice or bigotry would be in violation of that natural law, if you will, um, that that sense that each person is a manifestation of God. And I I thought that um, living in a diverse area, um, as I said, it's hard to hate up close, knowing lots of um, different people and that um, and that religious belief was really um, the, the foundation. And I learned after my mother died seven years ago that there was something else that she never told her, her children. Um, I don't know if she ever told her husband. She was an only child. Her mother died when I was very young um, and she was estranged from her father. So we never had any connection with her family of origin, except occasionally from her first cousin, who was also an only child. And so they they had a kind of sisterly relationship, even though they never lived um, in the same city. I heard from cousin Marge after mom's death that mom had been in love with someone else before she met my dad. She had been in love with a Filipino man and that her parents had forbidden the relationship and had ripped them apart. Um, we knew that my mom went to one semester of college and my father had no college. So we, once in a while, I think we had said like, why didn't you finish college or why didn't you continue? And mom just breezily like, it wasn't for me. 
The truth was that she went to one semester of college and lived on campus with a roommate who is a Filipino woman um, born in Hawaii, so Filipina American. And her brother um, met my mom and they fell in love. Um, they started dating and, and had a deeply devoted relationship. And when my mother's parents, and especially her father, learned of this, they did everything in their power to destroy this relationship. Um, they pulled my mother out of college. She didn't continue because they cut off the funding. They refused to support her until she broke off this relationship. She refused. Then they sent her from Los Angeles to Chicago to go live with other family to get her away from the boyfriend. They fought this for years, Marge told me. Boyfriend flew to Chicago at some point. Um, and anyway, there were all these threats. And finally, they succeeded in destroying this relationship. And years later, when my mother came back to Los Angeles, she met a white man, my father. She was engaged within weeks and married just a short time later. Um, I have no reason to believe that she didn't love my dad, but I'm so sad to think that, um, that she suffered so much loss and that, um, <laughs> maybe poor dad was not, was not her first choice, but, um, my, my mom became, um, early in their marriage, gravely depressed. Um, and she attempted suicide multiple times. She also had postpartum depression, I, she went through electroshock therapy. She had some really difficult things. And people who knew her before that time said that she was nowhere near the person she used to be, that she was fundamentally changed by that. And I, I don't know that losing her beloved caused all that. I mean, obviously postpartum depression and other things were a major factor. But I've come to believe that it likely played a role because it was a trauma. And it's a, a message to me about how racism destroys, um, how it destroys relationships, how it causes deep personal harm, including to white people, um, including to whole families and generations. We know from epigenetics that stress, trauma, especially when chronic, when it goes on over a significant amount of time, actually changes us. It changes our brains. We become um, less able to do executive functioning skills and more, um, more likely to blow up in anger or to not be able to manage um, you know, daily life things that come up. And that these kinds of traumas and stresses can actually be passed on in our DNA to our offspring. And so the traumas of racism, among other things, um, continue with us even when things so-called improve. So we need to, the, the, the urgency is to heal um, so that we can stop this cycle and, and, um, and help people's whole selves um, be healed so that they're not living with this and not, you know, continuing to pass it on. My other story is about structural racism, which all of us have experienced. Um, my dad served in the Korean War, and he benefited from the GI Bill, phenomenal program um, for those who served. And after that, because of the GI Bill, he was able to purchase a house in the Los Angeles suburbs with $1 down. Um, which that was a story throughout my whole childhood. Can you believe we got this house for $1 down in today's, in today's dollars, that same house, um, would require a down payment of at least $23,000. So to have that ability for someone who did not have any college, um, who did manual labor, who was, um, working class was phenomenal. And the GI Bill helped lots of white American families prosper in that same way, that we could accumulate wealth through property, through education in the post-war years. And that was not the promise for veterans of color. There has been wide disparity in how the GI Bill was implemented. And that disparity has driven some lasting gaps 
in education, um, property, wealth accumulation, and civil rights between white Americans and black Americans. So for a working class family like my own, um, to build enough wealth to retire, to send some children to college, and even to leave us a modest inheritance after they were gone, um, was really founded in that um, in that program. The notion that white privilege means white people ha always have economic privilege or live privileged lives is a misguided notion. The notion of white privilege means that because I'm white, race is not one of the problems that I encounter in my life or race that my race does not intervene in the ways that it does for BIPOC people, which is sometimes a term used for black indigenous and other people of color, um, that my father could come back um, and build a life, a middle-class life because of white privilege. He would not have considered himself privileged, but that's the, the term. What I've learned in my adulthood and in, in, in working with this, um, oh gosh, I just saw the note in the chat, Jen, about your friend's doctoral dissertation on the exclusion of Black Americans from the GI Bill. So interesting. Um, what I've learned from this is that an openness and curiosity is essential or essential to this work. Um, there's no right one right way um, to open yourself to more acceptance and equity mindedness, but to be open to learning and trusting in the voices and experiences of people different from ourselves um, to tell us about what life is like for them. Um, it takes in that vein, a humble attitude, sometimes referred to as cultural humility, but to be humble in the face of, um, again, other people's experiences that are not my own. So for, um, for me to do anti-racism work, I need to accept that my experience does not dictate what's reality um, or what I observe is not the wholeness of what's out there. It's required self-reflection. It's difficult work. I've had to look at things that I've said or assumed or believed in the past that were wrong, that were unintentionally hurtful, and to examine those things and make changes within myself, which brings me to the last piece of what's required for this work, a willingness to change, to say, I'm not fully baked <laughs> as a human. I hope that each day that of this life that I and all of us will continue to learn and change and grow. And that's what keeps this life so beautiful and worth the, worth the struggle, right? That we're always becoming um, like better manifestations of ourselves, more loving presences in the world. With that, I'm going to share some slides with you. <clears throat> in Anti-Racism 101. I've been influenced in my work by Robert Livingston, who's a professor in the Harvard School of Government, and he wrote a book a few years ago called The Conversation. That's a, been really um, insightful. He gives us some ideas about where to start. So I thought with a 101 kind of foundational piece, I would, um, I would draw from Livingston. He says we first need to really understand what racism is. I think a lot of us, um, think we know, um, but to really dive into what that means, because it's a term that's tossed around sometimes incorrectly, and that why everyone should be concerned about it, not just those who experience it as victims or as those on the harmed side of the equation, but that everyone um, should be concerned. And then once we're concerned how we can eradicate it and really change this world. Livingston proposes what is called the PRESS framework, which is an acronym for problem awareness. So first, understand the problem in its multiple dimensions, really learn. Then do a root cause analysis. So I can see what the problem is. Where did this problem originate? So an example is 
oh, the disparity in the GI Bill helped to drive some of the disparity that we continue to see today. That's an example of a root cause. That then by understanding, we can develop greater empathy and will care so much about the problem and the people it affects that we will want to be taking action. We'll want to make a change because we're empathizing deeply. We're ready to make the change. We move to strategies. Livingston says too many people, especially with anti-racism work, want to start with strategy. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's an issue. Somebody's not happy. What are we going to do about it? And he says that we need to spend a lot more time and energy in these first three stages so that our strategies will be effective. So the strategy stage is the actions, the implementation. And finally, the word sacrifice, he means that we are giving enough of our day, our life, our time to this work, even when it's very difficult over the long term, that we sustain it by giving of ourselves to it. So um, let's talk about each part of this. I'm going to start with the problem awareness. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I told you two examples of the problem of racism. Anyone want to share in the chat some example of why racism is a problem? in your, it could, and it could be a personal thing. It could be uh, an institutional thing. Just let's put a couple problems um, for that first piece of, of the press framework. Thanks, Jen. Preventing access to equitable education for everyone. I almost went to root cause there. <laughs> Honor the process. Let's just identify some problems. Anybody else? I'll wait for, for one or two more. Yep, the access to college. Thanks. Yeah, justice is one of my highest values. Me too. Um, find very find racism very difficult to deal with. It's a it's a fundamental injustice. It keeps our society unbalanced. It perpetuates a caste society. It's not what the founders intended. My family were redlined in the 1950s and could not live where they really wanted to because my father was black. And for us, it was housing, stock, and access to a good education. These are such um great articulations of problem the um yeah the gi bill um you know it wasn't that it was it was kept from black americans in a structural way but because of redlining black americans were not able to use that funding for housing in many cases okay thanks i'm going to just go back to the slides um so the, the problem of racism is all around us. We see it in interpersonal. So there were examples there of interpersonal things in their own families. And then we see it in these broad structural societal problems. Um, so the root causes of racism first require us to understand what race is, right? Because um, very interestingly, Race is not biologically real in that racial categories have been invented really in the last few hundred years. And they were invented to support worldviews that some people are superior and some people are inferior for thousands of years. All of all human history, right? People have been um, stigmatizing other people because of different cultures, different languages, different religions, different socioeconomic classes. It's really fairly recent in, in human history 
that people have categorized or stigmatized each other based on physical observable differences and things like the color of one's skin, the shape of one's eyes, the texture of one's hair. That's all fairly new. And science has unequivocally demonstrated that it's not biologically real. <laughs> In other words, we have very, very little genetic diversity. I'm just grabbing some water. <laughs> Thanks. Very little genetic diversity across the entire human race. There is um, such a tiny difference between two people of two different races that it's completely insignificant at the DNA level, at the genetic level that, um, that we're actually different. Race isn't even a good proxy for it. So for example, I'm married to a white man with brown eyes. I have blue eyes. With dark hair, I have light hair. Um, whose hair is more fine than mine? I have wavy hair. We are genetically as different as if I were married to a black man. The differences at the genetic level are more significant in terms of eye color, for example, than in terms of the amount of melanin in our skin. It really does not register at that level. So why is this such a huge issue? It is because a theory was invented about the inferiority of Africans as a means of enhancing the wealth and power of capitalists. So not just in the US, of course, um, in the UK and in other parts of Europe too, this idea was about enslaving people to produce labor and goods to enhance one's own capital and power. and. A, a really good PBS series from 2003 on race uh, makes the point that the enslavement of Africans was just seen as opportunistic. It, this could be an unlimited labor supply. And because of a difference in skin color, they could be identified if they ran away. So this was um, this was seen as a way to make it work um, for these um people trying to you know, establish their own power. So we have the founders of this country who are promoting liberty, freedom, and democracy on the one hand, and many of them also trying to justify slavery and exploitation. So as somebody said in the chat earlier, racism is not what the founders intended, certainly not intended in those ideals of liberty, freedom, and democracy, right? So if you also want to advance your power through the accumulation of wealth, through enslaved labor, how do you justify it? Well, you invent difference um, that you claim to be, you claim is real, and it gets then experienced as real. You claim that there's a natural God-given difference between white people and black people in this case, and that it's just the way it was intended. And then you use that as a way to justify what you're doing. And you're actually just creating a tool to justify your oppression and violence. So race is invented in that same way, uh, or race is invented in that way. And even though it then has grave consequences. Um, so the next piece I would say about an underlying issue is to, so we if we understand a little bit about race as a social construct, not as a biological fact, what is the notion of racism? Racism is tied to power. It is a system of oppression and advantage based on race. Race prejudice is different from racism. So if a black person dislikes me because I'm white, that is not reverse racism. That's prejudice. To be racism 
means there's social and institutional power behind it. And in our society, at this place in time, there isn't in that direction toward white people. There is not a social and institutional power of advantage or, or oppression that goes in that direction. So the important thing is to, to as, as Livingston and others have said, to name things correctly as a way of even getting into these issues. So another chance to jot something in the chat. Some people define racism this way, generally. And I'm wondering what you think about it, what you see as the problems with it. Some people see that individual acts are racism, you know, unkind people, bigoted people, and that they take these actions intentionally. Okay, absolutely. Proud boys, um, white supremacists, um, that, that's racism. Is there something else that doesn't fit into this? Individual, intentional acts committed by unkind or even you know hateful people. Stop the sharing again and see. Okay. Um, mm. Alice, I missed that at the time, but the um, absolutely um, the racism that is, or and that's often why we use the term anti-Semitism distinct from the term racism, because it's getting at Jewish identity as opposed to getting at white race. Um, so absolutely, there's, there's, um, there are other forms of power and oppression related to minoritized people in that way. So Megan says it's too far, it's, it's far too narrow a definition to just to be like individual acts of unkind people. And it doesn't adhere to the social power criteria. That's, yeah, that's helpful. Um, it would be racism if acts are committed against a particular race of people. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, that might be Vicky. I'm not sure, but that's a really good point. Um, yeah. And, and, and biracial people absolutely con contending with this in a completely different way, or people who um, phenotypically get mischaracterized are dealing with, um, with this in, in, in additionally complicated ways. Yeah, these answers are absolutely right. It's just too narrow. And so why does that matter? Because then we're only naming certain very blatant acts as racism, and we're not dealing with the broader, more common forms of racism in our society, in our communities, in our institu institutions, because there's a great defensiveness that can go up, especially among white people, right? When there's the um, indication that something is racist or someone's um, statement is racially insensitive or anything like that. This defense, um, this defensive wall goes up because we've so narrowly defined it that we're thinking, well, I'm not one of those white supremacist, hateful people. Why would I have a responsibility here? I am a good, well-meaning, um, kind person. And absolutely, even well my well-meaning, kind, good people can unintentionally, so it doesn't require intention, cause harm through racist assumptions. There's a really important distinction that I've had to contend with, and I think many of us have, between intention and impact. So I don't mean to hurt somebody's feelings. That doesn't mean their feelings weren't hurt. Maybe something and, and it, I'm saying both related to race and far beyond, there's a difference between what I intend as a good, generally well-meaning person who's not filled with hate. I intend um, to be inclusive, but I might unintentionally say something that 
that caused harm. And I, what I need to do is acknowledge the impact rather than defend my intentions. So to say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. You can absolutely say like, I didn't intend to, but I understand that I did. And so like, I'd like to make this right. Oh yeah. Microaggressions. Yes. Because we, um, microaggressions refer to, um, maybe unintentional and, and as the name implies more subtle, um, racist statements that people who commit them, including myself, I'll put myself in there. We never intended to cause harm and they're called microaggressions. Some, some people are like, there's nothing micro about them, but because over time, those kinds of things do do. If you think of them, like sometimes it's, it's compared to a paper cut. If you get the paper cut over and over and over again, soon you've got a real problem. Um, so the kinds of things where someone might say, um, Jenny, can I share an example that I yes. saw online? So a woman I follow on TikTok, a black woman, and she said the other day she went into Home Depot. She was looking in the plumbing aisle. She could feel a worker's, you know, she's like staring at me. But, you know, that happens from her perspective of her experience in the world. She's like, well, if she's here staring at me, I might as well ask her a question. So she asked her a particular question about a plumbing supply that she needed to do some home repair. And the woman said, why do you need the, the worker who was white said to her, well, why do you need that? Your landlord should fix that. Wow. Yeah. She said, I don't have a landlord because I own my home, you know? Yeah. And so that, that to me was like the perfect example of a microaggression where, you know, the worker, let's give her the benefit of the doubt while, why she was maybe staring at this woman and why, you know, she made this assumption that this woman couldn't, wasn't a homeowner for whatever reason, maybe she makes that assumption about everyone, but in this particular situation, it felt to the black woman and likely was a microaggression that I just thought was like, yeah, these are the, in that, if that's happening to you weekly, daily, monthly, over time, you know, it, Perfect example. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, just going to run back to the slides here. Um, so as Robin D'Angelo, who wrote White Fragility, said that that simplistic idea that racism is only, only this, intentional acts committed by unkind people, um, is really at the root of our defensiveness. So I like un unearthing that a bit as a way of getting at root causes so that we can um, kind of just, oh, okay, it's not, you know, racism is much broader than what I may have um, thought. And we know um, that those things can be explicit, but they can more often be implicit. And either way, they're based in fear. Like we, um, my grandfather, um, preventing my mother um, from dating the man she loved was, explicit in his fear or his sense of um, danger to his daughter in some way or in um, in her future life. But so often these happen in much quieter ways internally. And that's either way when we see the behavior and the policies, which brings us to the notion of structural racism. Some people are thinking, well, I understand how people can have hold racist beliefs, but what is what do you mean structural or systemic? It's the idea that we have normalized and legitimized all these dynamics in our history, in our institutions, in our cultures that are routinely advantaging white people and routinely producing adverse outcomes for people of color. So one of the comments in the chat, I think, came from Jen Reed about um, our educational system in the US. It is an example of structural racism. We fund, we're the only country in the world that I know of where we fund our public schools through property taxes so that the people who own property, the people who own the, the most valuable property have the most funding for their schools. And those who have less access to property, to wealth building, have the worst funded schools, routinely advantaging white people, routinely producing adverse outcomes for people of color. There's an article 
um, that I had shared with um, one of my senior college classes from B Business Insider. It's just got 26 charts that capture structural racism. Here's one example. Um, this is mortgage applicants applying to loans from banks to purchase homes and the ways in which those rates have been disproportionately advantaging white um, home seekers over black and other people of color. So the orange line, if you can see it, is at the top. Those are the denial rates, the highest for black Americans. The very bottom line, the, the navy blue, are the mortgage denial rates for white Americans. So white Americans denied mortgages in much, you know, much lower rates, in other words. So those, it's just another example of what we mean by structural racism. The last piece in terms of this getting to the root cause, I want to talk about colorblindness. Um, it's sometimes the term given to ignoring or overlooking race differences as a way of being polite or trying to promote harmony. So um, there's a TED talk by Tracy Ellis that I highly recommend where she talks about this as a black woman who had a white friend who said, Tracy, when I see you, I don't see you as a black woman. I, see, I don't see your race. I see you as a successful attorney, as a wonderful friend, all of this stuff. And Tracy Ellis said that compliment actually caused me harm because by being blind to color, you're being, you're purposely blocking out the consequences of that. Julian Bond put it that way. He's a, he was a civil rights activist and Tracy Ellis in her Ted talk says the failure to see my race is just obscuring racism. You're not seeing what I'm contending with. And then there you're therefore unintentionally perpetuating it. So it's an example of something that is meant to be kind where people will say, I just treat everyone the same because that implies that everyone's in the same place from the outset. But if you understand that everyone's dealing with their own battles and that if they are of a race other than white, they're dealing with race specific issues, then you come at it with a different understanding, which leads to the next step of the press framework, empathy. You got to understand the problem and the root causes of it to build your level of concern. And you start to like, oh, this is more significant. There's more history here than I realized. This is more widespread than I had first recognized. And I really need to act differently. I need to do things um, in my own life, in my spheres of influence um, to address this. I have a couple of ideas from the literature on how to continue to build that empathy over time. I put a book cover of something that um, both my husband and I loved um, this book, um, You Are Your Own Best Thing. That is a recent book. I listened to it on Audible and I loved it because each of the stories, so it's different people's stories of their racial identities and um, kind of something about their life that defined something important for them. On the audible version, each of them tells their own story in their own voice. So I thought that was fun to, to hear them. But um, books and essays by BIPOC or people of color. Um, and then the art and music. It's not like, a, it doesn't have to be a, you know, devastating slog to learn about um, empathy in terms of across, across races, but there's so much joy in experiencing art and music from other cultures. And then how can you, in your spheres of influence, in the places in your life, elevate the voices of racially minoritized people? Um, it may be by making a book recommendation, or if you're in a book club, suggesting a book that is um, by someone who is coming from um, a different racial perspective. It could be that you're incorporating education for yourself into your hobbies and the kinds of things you do in your daily life. Like if you 
like to go to museums, look for exhibits that are um, highlighting the work of BIPOC artists or history, things like that. Just an, uh, a way to continually build that empathy. The next piece in the press framework is the action piece, implementing the change in yourself, your relationships, your community. It really comes to this term anti-racism as opposed to just not racist. So Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote the important book, um, um, How to Become an Anti-Racist, said the opposite of racism is not not racist. It's anti-racism. It's the work of actively opposing racism by advocating for change rather than being just passively um, disapproving. He says that one of the strategies is to change the concept of racist from an identity. So we're not going to say that person's a racist. It's not that helpful. But to, to describe beliefs as racist, if they believe that certain people are superior and others are inferior, and, and to describe actions as, race, as racist or policies that are racist if they disproportionately hurt people of certain groups. I've also been really inspired by the organization Learning for Justice, which has a four-step process for speaking up against racism. They give us these um, strategies, literal strategies to interrupt question, educate, and echo. So just a quick run through of these. An example of an interruption is to say, maybe somebody said something um, that you perceive as hurtful to somebody, a member of another racial group. You could say, oh, I just want to go back to something you said um, and talk about that. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm curious about that term you used. It's a way to get into dialogue. You could ask a question. Could you tell me what led you to that? Or that's an interesting point. Where did you hear that? You could educate. You could follow up the question with an education. Oh, I learned something interesting about that. And another one. I know you were joking. I know you would never intend any harm. I recently learned that even though we don't intend it, sometimes the impact can be hurtful. And finally, to echo when someone else speaks up for justice. We might not come up with it in the moment ourselves, but we saw somebody else did that really well. Then we want to amplify their voice, say thank you to them. You might share it. If it's on social media, you might repost it to say, oh, I really liked this perspective. So those are some strategies to take. And they're all in the vein of this notion of calling in rather than calling out. The notion of calling out is saying, that's racist, you're racist. And you can imagine how productive that is. <laughs> People put up the immediate defense and they harden in their positions. They're not likely to soften and, and do any self-reflection if they're put on the defensive. So Loretta Ross is, um, she's in Massachusetts. Um, she has um, done the most work that I know of on calling in. She says that calling someone in is an act of love and that anti-racism at its heart is work of love. It recognizes what matters most is that people are growing and learning. It does not matter that we label somebody in a hurtful way. It matters that we try to invite somebody to that growth. It inspires self-reflection and it remembers the relationship we want to preserve in this dialogue. Finally, the notion of sacrifice that um, we, we are aiming to, I have to move my thing here, um, to invest the time, energy, and resources in this work, even when it gets tough. Requires a stance of humility. I'm a lifelong learner. My strategies will evolve as I gain more knowledge and skills. I don't always do it in ways that I'm proud of. 
I understand that how I relate to the world, my actions, my solutions, my words, they come from my experience of the world and how I've developed my perspective and understanding. When I see more complexity, I have more nuanced responses. And that's why our, that's why my learning is never finished. I want to continue to grow and change and, and become um, more loving in my response as a result. And I'm going to stop there and see if you want to talk for a few minutes. I just wanted to mention that um, the book that you mentioned, You Are Your Own Best Thing. Um, I have something called the Libby app, which I got oh, yes. free through my library. And I just downloaded the book, the audio version for free. So if you haven't checked out your local library's connection, they have Libby and they have, usually will have another kind of app where you can listen to audio books for free. So that was just my plug for the local libraries um, at hand here. But um, if folks, I see there's some comments in the chat. I don't know if you want to react to those, Jenny. But if someone did have a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand. I, I see Leslie's hand. You want to unmute and. First of all, I want to say it's wonderful to see you. I love, love, love the last class that you gave. I wish you would give another six week uh, course for senior college because uh, just like today's lecture, you're so stimulating. Everything you say really makes us think. And uh, I, so I wish you'd give another senior course. I did want to comment one of the Thank articles. You. One of the articles you had given us in that last class was about colorblindness. And I remember when I read that, I thought, wow, I've always considered myself colorblind. And I guess that's not such a good thing. So I really had to rethink that whole thing. And of course, it does make sense. One other thing I wanted to mention, coincidentally, right now, I happen to be reading The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, uh, which is a, uh, it's a very long book. Uh, my brother gave it to me because he said it's his favorite book. And it's about the great migration of Black people from the South to other areas of the country uh, in the 20th century. And it highlights three particular people with very different experiences. Uh, it's so interesting because of course, a lot of these people who migrated from the South found that when they went to other places that did not have Jim Crow laws, didn't make any difference. They were still finding racial prejudice no matter where they went. It is very, very interesting. But thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Leslie. What a love. You just made my day. Um, I would love, um, I was thinking of, an, of a senior college class next semester that's like a book club style where we read together and discuss um because there's so many great um things um another book recommendation oh maybe alice um that's coming i would love love that oh and then there's one from rebecca on um oh let me see you'll never believe what happened to lacy great thank you i don't know that one it's it's the one book, one community read for the spring. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. One book, one yeah. community. That's what the OBOC. Got it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Is the author coming to um, the area for that? The authors were going to charge something like $35,000 oh. to come. <laughs> so that's not happening, but the committee is working on student readers and they are coordinated along with um, the co-chair of the Juneteenth 2023 committee. They're coordinating along with us so that we can work together. Um, and the authors are women of color, and they uh, it's a humorous presentation of some of the outrageous things that have happened to them. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that recommendation. Um, and then we can we can discuss it as a larger community if if you want to be part of that. Um, I wanted to see unless there's a question. I don't see anybody's hand right now. Um, I saw, where is it? A question from Alice. What does that mean for equal opportunity? And I wondered, Alice, would you like to tell us more about um, like the context of your question? Sure, I'm a retired educator, so that's my bias. Mm -hmm. um, 
and um, the law said equal opportunity, but I get the idea. Um, I'm a retired psychotherapist also, I have to explain that. Um, from what you've discussed this morning that that really can't work um, because people are not equal. Right. There may be few genetic differences, but we're not all the same. And our needs are not the same. And our abilities are not the same. Right. So um, I guess I support what you're saying about um, empathy, um, but I'm also a strong proponent of individualization, if it's possible. Uh -huh to address difference yeah. rather than racism. Right. Um, I was looking to see if I could pull it up really quickly and I guess I can't in the next minute, but there's a, um, there's a graphic representation, a meme um, to show the differences between equality and equity. And maybe you've seen this, it's um, made its rounds in the last several years where you've got different people um, viewing a baseball game on the other side of a wood fence. And equality meant that each of the individuals, despite their height differences, were given the same size box to stand on so that the tallest person didn't even need a box to look over the fence. And the shortest person still couldn't see with one box. And the idea is that equality, oh, did you find it? You're fabulous. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Um, the idea is that the same for everyone doesn't work for exactly the reasons you're saying. Each person has different needs and race is one component of that, of the dimensions of our identities. And a move toward equity is an attempt to look at what does each learner or person in this organization need to be successful? And it's definitely more resource intensive, more time intensive, but I would argue, and I think lots of people in equity-minded work have evidence to show that that time investment, that resource investment pays off um, in untold multiple ways because we have everybody's succeeding at a much better level. Let's see. Anybody else? Last things. A couple of uh, questions in the chat there. Uh, oh, I okay. Think of Stephen and. Yeah. Yeah. So Stephen said that he heard that Black people had faster muscle twitch fibers. That's why they can run fast. I don't know that viewpoint, but there certainly, it can be things like, it, because individual um, people worked really hard at something and developed um, their muscle strength, their, um, in whatever case that may be, that then they pass on genetically to their children, but it's not dependent on their racial heritage from what, um, I've read in, bi in biology that there were, um, you know, people will say, oh, how come, you know, black um, athletes dominate in the uh, NBA, for example, it's not because of race, but it certainly um, in developing the skills and passing those um, genes on to children. And then, you know, to all the hours spent practicing, of course. Um, and then from each according to his ability to each according to his need from Karl Marx. I'm not sure, but that's an interesting statement. Yeah. Any, am I missing anything, Jen? I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, Jenny, your, yeah. your effort, your knowledge is uh, so appreciated by me. And I know by all the folks that were here today and by senior college in general, you've been such a great partner and um, educator with us. And so, you know, you have an open invitation to come back anytime in any format in any way on any course. I think we would listen to you teach a course on, you know, I don't know, trash reality TV or something, but I'm sure you don't even participate in that nonsense. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but we're thrilled. So a big round of applause for you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I hope to see all of you soon in senior college. And if you have any questions or you want to engage in conversations like this, I encourage you to join. Let's see, I'm thinking of a class that we have coming up with uh, John Winters. Um, he's a staff person here at the university, and he's a uh, incredible expert on African American literature, and he's focusing, focusing specifically in that class on the memoir. So you'll get to read some of the best, uh, most uh, known memoirs by um, Black authors. So join us for that opportunity. And specifically, you'd be doing what Jenny has asked us all to do, which is to engage in, um, you know, literature around Black authors, which is so important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day.